Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. So up next, we have Eric Birch with um, AGT Foods. Eric's going to give us a rundown on what's happening in the pulse industry and hopefully some I'll look at the markets there. And once again, if you have questions, go to the Q&A and type them in there um, and we'll get after it. So Eric, you're up next. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, that was a, I was interested to see the, uh, see the weather patterns. And I think sometimes uh, predicting the markets is uh, just as difficult as predicting the weather at times. So we, we know what's right in front of us, but predicting what, once they're going to go out uh, in the future is sometimes a, a guessing game as, as much as anything. So I'm just going to give you a little update on the markets, you know, through each of the, the peas, lentils, uh, chickpeas, and then get a little bit into, from an ingredient perspective, a little update on that space and what's happening and how that's impacting the overall all market for, for pulses. Um, just a little background for those of you who don't know on an AGT Foods. So AGT Foods was started in 2003. Uh, the company was started, you know, really to be an origin-based processor. So we wanted to position factories, you know, within areas where peas, lentils, chickpeas are grown. So when you look at all the major production areas around the world, um, AGT's positioned their, their facility. So from 2003 to, from our CEO's basement to over 45 factories around the world, um, in 2007, we became a public company. Then in 2019, actually bought the company back from the public um, and made it a, a private company again. So we're, we're owned by a group called Fairfax Financials, owned 6%, 12% uh, owned by Point North Capital, and then 28% owned by uh, the AGT management group. But the, the key in this is that, you know, we're driven by further enhancing the value added production, further enhancing the whole ingredient platform and expanding that space to, to continue and expanding the, the market opportunities outlets for, for pulses, uh, not only in, in North America, but, but across the world. So a little update on, you know, the short term update regarding uh, each of the crops. So yellow peas right now, we're seeing, we're, we're continuing to see firm demand from China. Um, we've seen a, you know, a massive amount of exports from both U.S. and Canada uh, to China. Some of that in, you know, in relation to the increased prices of uh, soy, which caused peas to to increase. But and where they're using peas as a as a supplement. So not only for feed use in in China, but also for uh, the use of the protein production and the starch production for vermicelli noodle, which we've seen, you know, in continue increase. We're expecting to see acres up in Canada. Um, in the U.S. right now, it appears will be flat, maybe maybe a little up in the U.S. I think uh, soybean prices today are, are putting some pressure on pea acres here in the middle middle North Dakota, eastern half of North Dakota. Um, USDA has been purchasing a large amount in the last uh, 30 days. Um, that's also going to put some pressure on the overall stocks. Um, so the question there will be, will that continue to to increase? So stocks are starting to demand, are starting to uh, tighten and uh, we'll continue to tighten if demand continues at this at this pace. Uh, green peas, you know, we have a fairly decent inventory of green peas out there, so demand is flat today. Um, one of the few times historically where green peas are at a discount to yellows, uh, we're we're expecting acreage of uh, green peas to to decline into uh, 2021, with most of it converting to to yellow peas or to uh, to lentils. So you look at the uh, you know the field pea prices uh, for the last uh, ten months. Um, this is where we're starting to see uh, yellow peas, where they transitioned to be more expensive than than green peas here in the last uh, 45 last year, really 60 days. We've seen the price of yellow peas really starting to to climb and, and strengthen. Um, you look at uh, for for lentils, uh, you know markets are firm today. Uh, India crop is okay. Middle Eastern crop is starting to come in now. Um, you know we're expecting acres in Canada to be flat to down. Um, lentils in general expect increase in 2021 in North Dakota and, and Montana. Um, we're seeing where both green and reds are expected to to go up. Now, how deep is the red lentil and and green lentil? Um, Demand is is really up in the air on what what will happen there. You know, India really isn't driving the market today for for red lentils. Uh, we're seeing it in other regions, just just in general. We're seeing, you know, lentil demand continue to to grow. So this one, we're, you know, we're not we're not knowing. I guess 
yeah, how deep is that the run in the the lentils? Where yellow peas appears to be um, set to be going for here for for a little bit. Uh, you look at the you know U.S. lentil prices. Um, this is green lentils. Again, we've seen the increase here, you know, since uh, middle of October and continue to go up um, into to January. How long will this run is is really not known right now. But right now, we've seen some good demand for for all lentils. Um, chickpeas, you know, large supply in the market today um, of the Kabuli type. We are seeing Desi values starting to firm up in um, in India, in you know different, uh, you know Australia, different markets around the world, if the if Desi market continues to decline, we could see uh, Kabulis being used to replace the the Desis, um, which would cause the Kabuli market to or the stocks to to shrink. Um, we're seeing big demand today from Pakistan, Bangladesh for for the uh, for the chickpeas, faba beans. Normal market is is soft. The, when I say normal market, so I'm talking normal consumption markets. When you look at North Africa, when you look at um, regions that typically do consume fava beans, but what we're seeing change here um, recently is the the ingredient demand is is really starting to grow, and that's what I'm going to get into here quite a bit is what's happening with, with the fava beans um, and the the response that we're seeing from the investment and in, you know including fava beans as an ingredient in in foods. So in, in general, I mean the the, the markets today are are fairly strong for for peas, lentils, uh, chickpeas are steady, maybe a little bit quiet today. Fava beans are are quiet, other than the ingredient demand. Um, will it continue? We've seen yellow peas kind of level off here now in the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of movement. Uh, you know the demand continues, but we haven't seen a lot of movement in the the market. Um, lentils, you know, continue to to firm. Um, so in, in general, we got decent prices going into to spring. We'll see how long they hold. And and really, we're watching the crops as, you know, India, watching the Indian crop. We're seeing the Middle Eastern crop will be coming off here here shortly. And then we have the, uh, you know, the plantings in North America and how that will impact, uh, impact the overall market. Yep. I guess we're not seeing the individual slides. Some of them aren't seeing the individual slides. Oh, you're able to see it, Brian? Um. Yeah, for some reason I am, but they're not going through. Um, okay. Must be stuck on the, the top. There you go. Yeah. Let me uh, try this one more time. Is that better? Um, I guess, I, let me see here. Okay. I think it's okay now. Okay, it's just when I go to full, full view. Um, so I'll just go like this if that's okay. Okay, yep, that's fine. It's not in presentation mode, but I think you can see it from here. Okay. So I, I guess. Uh, okay. Th that's really the update when it comes to the the overall. Um, each of the sp specific crops. Um, now I'm going to get into a little bit on overall the next, uh, you know, what pulses are going through here um, over the last couple of years and where we see it uh, going forward. And, you know, historically, when you looked at uh, pulses, you know, when I would talk 10, 15 years ago, it was always about India would drive the market, um, whatever happens in the Indian demand. And don't get me wrong, India still does the drive the market. I mean, if they're in the position where they need to purchase, they have poor crops. Um, it does um, impact the overall overall industry and what happens. But we're seeing this growing demand from from the North American market, from the European market, from you know what we consider non-traditional markets that are really starting to impact and drive um, the overall movement of, of pulses. When you look at um, North America, for example, uh, the amount of peas that have moved through uh, pet food markets has been you know, record amounts and really has become one of the largest markets that we have as a as an industry. And now you're looking at the investment going on um, throughout the, the globe when it comes to production of protein, when it comes to uh, production of flowers, uh, those those market opportunities are, are growing. And we're seeing that in, in North America where we're seeing, uh, you know, four or five companies investing in 
in you know multi-million dollar facilities that will uh, require a lot of peas to produce the the products that they're looking at manufacturing here. So that to me, that's good signs for the industry and in that we are really going through um, an evolution of the industry where we're transitioning from what historically is a dominant export product, uh, you know, whole pulses, split pulses, uh, pack, you know, package pulses and distributing them around the world to where now it's we're taking a phase and moving into flour production, protein production, um, food ingredients. So you look at, you know, I showed this timetable, you know, we're some of the oldest crops in the world. And I would say one of the biggest things that we did to them is split them. Uh, so to me, what we're going to do in the next 20 years um, will be more innovation that we've ever applied to pulses in the really in, in the history of time. So you look at, you know, the International Year of Pulse kicking that off in, in 2016. Um, raising awareness for pulses in general to where we are uh, today, we've continued that tide from that from that year, um, which I, I think did have an impact on, on raising awareness for for what pulses are about. So you look at the the changes in, in consumers. Um, you know, protein obviously has a positive image with consumers. Uh, plant based diets continue to to grow. Um, you know, allergy concerns. Um, continue to, to grow, uh, consumers demanding more proteins for, you know, diet, sports, nutrition, uh, natural, clean label. Really a lot of things that pulses bring to the table is what consumers are are looking for today. And, um, you know, you, you know, food companies, they're looking at, they want non-GMO, they want gluten-free, they want plant-based, uh, they want sustainability sourced. So when you look at these four items, uh, those are things that pulses check off every one of them um, that end up, you know, fitting in that perfect uh, that perfect window to where we can really cap capitalize on the opportunity in front of us um you know high protein claims are are common you know ingredients derived from plants grew by 103 percent from 2010 to 2014 um, protein derived from plants grew by 61 percent from 2010 to 2014 and we're we're continuing to see that growth and i actually have a typo it shouldn't be 14 i do apologize for that but we're continuing to see this this overall demand um continue to grow both on the consumer level and the food company and the consumers really are driving what the food companies do and the food companies drive what we do and you know we're on, on what we uh, produce and what we go to contract with you so this is this is really a consumer driven market uh, market today so you look at the the launches of, of pulses over the last uh, five years uh, we're gathering the 2020 numbers now as far as what's been bit launched but you know we've continued in this growth pattern i can tell you that 2020 will be continued to to grow um one thing that we are seeing differently now is pet food is kind of leveling off there is still some growth in pet food you know we've gone through some of the um the issues regarding the, the dcm but that seems to be calming a little bit where pet food is getting back a little bit back to normal um, but we're really starting to see the the climb in the the, the food space. Um, food we know takes um, you know five three five three to five years for for specific launches, and really over the last uh, several years, we've seen the pipeline being filled up for projects. Now the pipeline is full. Now that pipeline is reaching the point where we're seeing continuous launches um, year after year. So we're seeing uh, more innovation, uh, more things there being pushed into the market that. That contain uh, you know pulses, and we always said from the very beginning that the the dream was to walk. You know, you look in the go through the grocery store and see everything that's made from corn and soy. Um, the dream is that you know that could be changed to to pulses. You know, going through a grocery store, reading labels, and then you know seeing you know peas, lentils, fava beans, dry beans on the on the labels of of foods that we uh, that we consume uh, each day. So you look at some of the the launches that have gone on over the last um, the last couple of years. You have you know dairy free uh, heavy whipping cream, um, Beyond Meat burgers. There's Impossible. There's the Light Life Burger. So these this has been an area that has continued to grow. Um, you know it has been impacted some with the pandemic here in the last uh, um, you know over the last year, especially within the the um, the food service area. But from a retail point of view. This area continues to to remain strong, and and we've seen this this grow um, substantially. Uh, the grain free pet food, the uh, you know the pasta. You have the Brilla pasta, the Zambi pasta, 
you know, AGT launched their pasta this past uh, this past spring. Uh, the milk dairy free space um, continues to grow. Obviously, Ripple is one of the big players in there. You have uh, you know the snacking. Uh, snacking was one of the very first uh, products that that came out with pulses. Um, you know, for five six years ago, and that whole space continues to, to grow. Here we have. Um, Kashi Go, so this is made by Kellogg's. Number one ingredient on this product is lentil protein. Um, so you look at all these different products, here you have fava beans, here you have um, peas, here you have uh, peas, mainly peas, uh, this is yellow peas, this is chickpeas, uh, peas, this is uh, pea protein, uh, again, peas, this is lentils, this is fava beans, lentils, and chickpeas, this is red lentils, uh, this is yellow pea. So all different products are going. And this is just a small snapshot of what of what we're seeing in the in the market. And what's really causing, uh, you know, the investment in this space. When you look at, you know, what AGT is invested in. And I'll get into your little bit on what we're doing in in Minet. Um, you look at ADM. You do look at Roquette. You look at Ingredient World Food or Pyrus. You look at all the different companies that can continue to announce expansion or, or development of their infrastructure to uh, to supply markets such as this. Um, you know, one of the great stories, um, and sometimes this can be controversial for other people also, but one of the stories that really drives pulses with a lot of consumers um, and customers is the sustainability story that pulses bring. Um, they are a low water user, the nitrogen fixing. Um, to us as producers, um, it may seem routine or not unique, you know, what pulses do to, from a rotational point of view or due to environment, but this story does go a long ways to, to consumers, to food companies. Um, a lot of them have a long-term initiatives that drive uh, their purchasing decisions based on sustainability. Um, so if you don't carry a strong sustainability story, it may be something that they may not consider, but the fact of what pulses do to the rotation, you know, as I've Travel the world, visit with food companies. Uh, I talk about how pulses have really did change uh, Western North Dakota, Montana agricultural production. You know, going from you know to no-till systems, going you know replacing summer fallow, um, and how that's impacted overall production agriculture is is a great story that you know um, that's taken very is very well received by by all the food companies that are that are working with these these products. So when you look at our, you know, we made the investment here about in 2013, we built our first uh, line to produce protein. Um, and since we invested over um, $80 million into our mine at location uh, to produce all the different different ingredients. And, you know, today we're producing flour, or I, actually today we're, yeah, we're producing flour, proteins, fibers, starches. Um, we're now making a veggie crumb, which is a bread crumb replacement. We're making pasta. And we're also making texturized protein um, within our facility here in Minot. So today we're we're moving around 120,000 tons of ingredients, uh, leaving our leaving this factory. And again, this was a market that wasn't there 10 years ago. Um, so this market has has changed and has been a, a big driver for for the industry. So you look at what's happening with uh, with pulses, and you know this is an idea of just in generality of how we're splitting the pulses up. And today, uh, this isn't even all the, this isn't even all the uh, channels of how we're splitting the, the product up. But today, when a pea enters our factory, it's being split seven different ways. Um, so we get seven different products from that, from that pea or that lentil or fava bean and distributing that then um, to all kinds of different markets uh, around the world. So, you know, making granulated flowers, making fine flowers, fibers, starches, proteins, and again, this isn't just an AGT phenomenon. This is happening, uh, you know, all across uh, North America, happening in Europe. Um, this type of investment's going into uh, different regions around the world. Um, then going further downstream, you know, we're then taking those ingredients. We're actually producing the, the dry pasta press, you know, for retail, food service, industrial. Um, today we're in supermarkets across North Dakota and, you know, on Amazon. And then you have our the bit, and then we make a veggie crumb, or we're making the texturized protein, which is used as the base uh, for like the meatless products, um, you know, gelatinized flowers, crisp puffs, 
snacks, um, all kinds of things that are, you know, different products that are being made from, from our ingredients. So some of the things, you know, when you look at this whole area of where we're shifting our, um, the market demand, you know, some of the things that the market's looking for for pulses is, is changing. Uh, you know, in our traditional markets, it's all about color, size, um, you know, cracked seed coats, uh, you know, those type of things that impact the overall quality of pulses as we distribute them into markets that it's really based on, on visual. Uh, so, you know, when they look at the product, they want to see the right color and the right size of a product. You know, that's what they base a lot of the, the uh, purchasing, purchasing on. But now today, <clears throat> the big factors that we're after, and this is, you know, obviously some of the, grow we, as an industry, we've gone through some growing pains, and, growing pains and some of this is, you know, allergen free. Um, you know, I know it's, it's tough, you know, with, when, when you're, working with wheat and working with soy, working all kinds of different products within your, your farming, uh, if it's in your operations and to maintain that soy and gluten free. But that really is what's driving the pulse demand today is the fact that um, we are non GMO, we are gluten free. So those are factors that have to be protected when delivering to our customers is, you know, a lot of them today are one zero tolerance for, for example, in soy, which zero tolerance is very difficult, but it is a, is a big demand that that they have, you know, free of molds, you know, watching the storage molds, watching those things, making sure that we're holding the crop in good condition. Um, without that is difficult. Uh, well, we were not able to move because we have to do micro analysis on all the material, uh, microbiological analysis on all the material that we supply to, to our customers. And that becomes um, extremely important to them. And then high protein, you know, continue to look at, you know, what are ways that we can increase the protein level of of pulses uh, through agronomic work, uh, through variety development, um, whatever it may be, you know, finding ways to to increase that overall protein because there will continue to be pre premiums for protein in the market. Um, and I would say there's, you know, that continued demand for, for protein is, is not going away. And, um, you know, we'll, most everybody's in a position today where they are offering that premium in, for the food ingredients for that, for that high protein. So I'm going to leave most of it for for questions, but I, I have a just a couple closing comments, you know, for the um, for this session. But you know, the strong demand remains for the yellow peas and lentils going to 2021 production. You know, will that continue? We'll you know we'll we'll wait and see. It's like uh, Eric said earlier is you can predict the weather, you know, for the next 21 days. Beyond that, it starts to become um, you know starts to become guesses. You can look at the trends and see what happens, but Really, the the weather has an impact on overall what happens to the market also. So as that changes, um, can impact the market just as much. So we will, you know, as we we go into the spring here and get closer to our harvest, to you know, we'll see where where the market takes us. USDA purchases, um, will they continue? Um, you know, we've had some big ones here in the last uh, month. Um, we expect to see some more coming, but you know, it's hard to tell with what happens uh, what happens there. You know, pet, far, pet food market, you know, appears to be continuing on. You know, we had the issues with the DCM here this past year. Um, we've seen uh, where, um, you know, we've seen some of the demand uh, start to tailor off, but that appears to be recovering. You know, as we've gone through COVID, we've seen, you know, continued growth within that that space. One thing about pets is, uh, we, you know, there has been record adoption of pets in, in North America. I think most of the... Um, Oops, I'm sorry. Most of the um, most of the shelters are empty. In fact, I've heard people are importing pets now. So the the market, the pet food market in general, has expanded just because we're feeding a lot more feeding a lot more pets than we were a year ago. Um, so that's one of the big changes we've seen. But we've seen a lot of our pet food customers their their demand uh, and plants are are pushed uh, pushed hard as that that whole space continues to grow. You know, North American European food markets continue to to incorporate pulses. That whole space, I expect to to grow. There is, you know, a tremendous amount of um, investment going into not only um, the research and development into these food products, but also the overall uh, promotion of um, of pulses uh, as you know for for consumption. In fact, on 
uh, last week, I think it was last week or the week before, um, there was a company that featured one of their new products on Good Morning America. Um, and it was a pasta made from, from pulses or from yellow, from yellow peas. So just overall, there's a tremendous amount of not only research development, but marketing dollars are being put into to pulses. So I see, you know, we're going through that, that transition from an export market to, you know, a domestic market and that whole space. I, it's exciting to see what will happen here over the next uh, 10 years, but I see that to grow. And then the value added processing capacity will continue to grow in North America. Um, you know, continue investment by, by several parties on this whole whole space and the one advantage that bring that this will bring to the um to the industry really is you know sometimes in the export mar export market is feast or famine where you know there may be a hot market for three or four months and then it will tailor off and then there's, there's seasonality where um certain times of the year the market will will drop and be quiet there'll be very little movement where when you get into the the uh, food ingredients the demand from for markets is all year round. So they are producing these uh, food products uh, 24 seven all year round. Now there might be some slow strong periods, but there will be a continued demand uh, throughout the year. Um, so in a lot of times these companies are contracting, uh, but the one thing that, that will change is I think we'll see more uh, contracts, more uh, production contracts coming out and less uh, spot purchasing. A lot of these food companies uh, will be booking, will book their demand for, for a year. They don't buy typically on a spot basis. They need to lock in their, their cost as they have specific budgets to, to hit. So a lot of times when there's contracts out there, when those contracts are fulfilled, there's a good chance that that, that market then is fulfilled and there, you know, that company or, you know, uh, group won't be back uh, to purchasing because once they filled their month, their yearly demand, um, then they will, then use that material for them for the rest of that year and do very little spot purchasing. So that may be one thing that, that changes where when you get into some of the export markets, spot purchasing still still is active and people will buy, you know, certain times of the year, buy, you know, short term, um, short term volume, you know, every, you know, monthly ball volume where in the, the food ingredient space, it, it comes down to to annual contracts. And in some cases we're being asked, and this might be something that come out where people are looking for two or three year contracts um, where they want price uh, stability for, for two, three years out. So that might be something that, you know, maybe opportunities for growers that if they want to lock in um, a certain amount of their production, it can be for, for multiple years. So I see that as some, some different marketing strategies that we haven't seen in the past that could be coming out here over the next, uh, in the next couple of years. So with that, I didn't have, much more than that, I guess. If there's any questions or comments or anything like that, it'd be, I'd love to take them. Okay, I mean, got any questions? I'll just do the Q and A. But um, here's one for you, Eric. And I got mm -hmm. kicked off for some reason for a little bit, so you might have talked about this. Um, what does the market in India look like? I mean, do you see anything loosening up on that or? Stuck where we at. Yeah, I mean, right now, um, India is, uh, you know, right now they've had some good moisture. The crop looks looks okay, you know, but that can that can change. I mean, right now we don't anticipate any change like in their their tariffs, but you never know. I mean, when the tariff came on, it came on overnight. When it come out, it could come off that way also. Or or if they just continue that, you know, if they fall short in supply, you know, they may see that. You know, we may see that demand pick up again. Um, like I said, Desi market's uh, high, so that could cause a push to purchase like Kabulis, you know, some other products to yellow peas to replace um, the Desis. Um, so we'll we'll see where that goes. But right now, I don't think nothing uh, nothing scheduled to to change. Okay, uh, we do have a question. Uh, why does the USDA buy peas? So USDA is buying peas for the food aid program. Uh, so yellow peas have been historically bought for, for I mean, for last, uh, I would say last 25 years, uh, yellow peas have been one of the main products USDA buys for, for food aid. Um, you know, and typically a lot of it's going to sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, 
you know, but but it does go different regions around the world. And I think on average they'll purchase up to you know 100, 100 around 100,000 tons of of yellow peas uh, annually. But they also buy lentils at times. Um, they have recently been buying some green peas also. Um, we've seen some purchases of whole greens here. I think this last uh, last tender, the tender before. Um, so it's 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 for uh, food for food aid. Okay, I have another question here. He says, can you talk a little bit more about the difference for green and yellow market? And again, what does it look like for 2021? Yeah, it's just today, you know, we're seeing that the, the, the bigger demand for, for yellow peas. Um, when you look at China, um, for example, I'm just going to go up to this. When you look at China, we've just seen a very strong demand into to China for for yellow peas, and um, it seems like it's been endless amounts of vessels of yellow peas going to China. And some of it is for as a feed, like pigeon feed, different uh, feed products. You know, with soy increasing, they may be looking at some replacement of where they would typically move their soy and using yellow peas. And then just the overall demand there from the the protein side of uh, and re really in China, it's about the starch production they're not after the protein in the peas, they're after the, the starch, and then they end up exporting the protein um, you know, all around the world. But overall, that, that demand for, for those products has, has grown for, for the you know, Chinese industry. Um, you know, in green peas, just we haven't seen that, that big movement in, in green peas. Uh, that market's been, it has increased some, but it's been, it's been fairly, um, fairly flat here of, of recent. So I, we don't anticipate that going up unless, again, there's a big movement where uh, you know, maybe USDA starts purchasing a lot of the, the stocks of the, the green peas. Um, or we, you know, obviously if we're gonna have a decrease in production, green pea production, that could cause greens to, to recover. It's just right now we, there's a fair amount of inventory and we're seeing a, um, that product uh, not moving as well as yellows. And then all the protein production that you're seeing and pet food demand typically is in the form of yellow peas. So just overall market opportunity and demand for yellows have, have been, uh, has been growing over the last uh, five, six years, and we're seeing that accumulating now. Eric, you talked about fava beans. As um, you see in the need for more acres to be put in is there demand for that yeah fava beans really uh is starting to become a, a hot item within within the food space um and when i say food space i'm talking the north american um european uh, you know food when you're seeing like the i show that that dairy-free creamer um you look at there's some of the the snacks that are coming out with fava beans and really, they one of the reasons they like fava beans um, is because of the the the, fra the the taste profile of fava beans. It's it's much better than what you would consider yellow peas. Um, so they don't have to use as many maskers. They don't have to you know hide the flavor as much. So we've seen that demand. And then plus also the high level of protein. Um, typically, fava beans will have you know upper twenty percent uh, protein, where peas are normally that twenty two twenty three percent. So we are seeing that that demand for the for the fava beans starting to come, and I would expect that's going to be a a growing crop here um, over the next uh, two years, uh, where we're going to see a continue continued demand and and opportunities with with fava beans. And I think a lot of it is going to be you know contract growing. Um, you know I see there's going to be some IP opportunities I believe in in fava beans. Um, is there some specific varieties coming out there that you know, have a specific demand for, for customers. So it could be a unique opportunity for, for a, some more diversification in, in what we're growing for pulses. Okay. Um, question is, um, as far as uh, glyphosate, mm -hmm. what's, um, are you guys demanding less use of that or Offering better contracts. Yeah, in fact, I should have had that off of the uh, or on my uh, the last slide. Glyphosate definitely is a um, 
you know, an item that's not that's not going away. People are are demanding for glyphosate free. Um, we've been we've been actively purchasing like some glyphosate free red lentils. Um, in most cases, yeah, there has been a, a premium for that glyphosate free. Um, but we're we're getting continued demand, and we've been asked by many of our major ingredient customers to prepare a plan to deliver to them glyphosate free uh, products. Um, and when we say glyphosate free, they're they're wanting stuff that's less than 10 to 20 parts per billion. Um, so the testing is very minute where when you get to 10 parts per billion, spray drift um, sometimes can be a problem, um, even though you didn't apply glyphosate. So they're, we're putting together plans. They've asked us for, you know, plans to sustain that. And in some cases, it's we're talking large volumes that they want that to be glyphosate free. So that is an area that definitely not not going away i could anticipate some contracts coming out here fairly soon uh for the glyphosate free in fact i've seen i have seen some other contracts out from others um, where they are specifically asking for for that glyphosate free um so again i i see that as an issue and i would encourage that if you have an opportunity to to not apply glyphosate i think it's something that you may want to may want to consider i think it it increases uh it increases your your opportunities um, and chances if you can come through with something that is is considered glyphosate free. Okay, um, just letting you know. Just in case I get kicked off, my says my internet's being unstable. So just if I go away, hopefully Grant can step in for me. Uh, one other question: As far as new products, is AGT coming out with something else? And you just came out with your your veggie pasta. Is there anything else you're working on that you can share with us? Yeah, I mean, we we have the veggie pasta. One thing that we are adding the veggie pasta is we are going to be coming out with um, some different shapes. So in March, we should start seeing our, our penne and large elbow shapes um, coming out. Um, you know, we have the, the veggie crumb. We're not retailing that today, uh, but that's something that we do have some customers that are retailing that product, um, our texturized proteins. Um, you know, it you never know, there might be some more things that we do do come out. I mean, right now we're, we're supplying a lot of these products as ingredients also. Um, when you look at our, our pasta, it's, you know, it's starting to grow like in frozen meals, uh, canned pastas. Um, you're looking at, um, you know, food service, uh, school lunch programs, um, hospitals, uh, you know, we're nursing homes. We're working with all kinds of different groups that are utilizing our, our pasta. And, you know, this gives you a sense of um, the importance of like the allergen free where, you know, we've seen this grow more and more. We, In fact, I had a, a phone call uh, the other day from a grocery store in um, in North Dakota. It was a small town store and, you know, they wanted us to start sending them some cases of pasta they wanted to put on their, their grocery store because they had a, a teenage girl in town who had some major health problems and discovered that one of the only few things that she could eat is, is our yellow pea pasta. Um, so now they're stocking on the shelf. So that family has pasta to buy, but we're seeing that case grow and grow more and more um, the, the, the food allergies and, and sensitivity to, to allergies. So things like our veggie pasta, you know, there's other gluten-free pastas out there also that, um, you know, creates opportunities, I guess, you know, to help uh, consumers, um, you know, with their, with issues like that, but also, you know, put, puts you as growers in position to, to supply that market like that. So in general, yeah, I mean, we're, there's probably going to be some more products coming out, nothing more than I can probably that I've shared today, but um, we we're continuing to see, see that. And um, who knows, there might be some interesting things coming out from our, from us here in the next uh, three to four months. Eric, appreciate you, you taking time to enlighten us on that. On behalf of Northern Pulse Growers, you know, uh, we appreciate you stopping in and taking time to listen to this. And we will all talk to you later. And if you got any questions, um, you can email me. Well, I guess I, I, one thing I didn't do is I'm the marketing director for Northern Pulse Growers Association. I don't know if I said that before or not, but uh, you can certainly um, get online and give us an email if you got any questions or give us a call. Uh, thanks, everybody. And I'll turn it over to Grant. I think we all can leave here. Have a good day.